Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out to CornCon. And yes, John is right. I'm as old as dirt, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, John's been on an office conference, and I've always uh, supported the community as much as I can. Um, and this is some of the areas that, that I go on to uh, with that. Um, to give a, a talk a little bit about that from the A corporate introduction perspective of that. I'm CISO for Motorola Mobility. I have responsibility for our parent company as well. So on a day, my day job is managing um, a global organization that has uh, $60 billion in revenue, operates in 170 countries around the world, uh, and does things at scale uh, that usually most organizations don't uh, on that side of it. So, that being said, I've been CISO now going on 15 years. So I've been to a place, I've had different reporting structure, I've had different owners of the company. I worked for Google for a while, uh, I worked for Motorola as a whole, and so I've reported up for things. So 15 years can be sliced however you want to, but I stay around. Uh, I'll also give you some other points of interest on that. I have the same team that I started with 15 years. Uh, except for two people, one got sucked in by the Google Storm uh, and could not come back, and the other person had to retire, or wanted to retire. So uh, it's pretty much the same crew that I've been doing with new additions as we've moved on uh, from that side of it that's there. Um, as everything goes, um, I really wish ransomware would encrypted my slides, but it didn't, so you're in for a presentation. So I always use a background reading perspective, <laughs> which says, this is usually how I feel in most of the times where I go. Um, the center cartoon is one of my favorite Farsight cartoons. I have a coffee cup for it and everything else, because I feel this is the perfect scenario for cybersecurity. We go into these situations where we're looking at things, and it doesn't matter our choice. We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. Which one are we going to choose? And that is usually the paradox that we're in, uh, nine times out of 10. Uh, if I fix this, this breaks. If I don't fix it, this other thing happens that's even worse than if I break things. And so you run into those scenarios daily. And how you navigate those scenarios and how you communicate those scenarios is kind of the key to success in a lot of areas uh, that's there. Um, I have an interesting backstory. I've worked for large organizations. I'm, I, I do a lot of tweeting. You can follow me as Secrich on Twitter. Uh, I put things out there almost daily on that. You can find me um, in uh, LinkedIn, fairly easy. Uh, that's there. I'm not the rocket scientist that works uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, <laughs> but uh, I'm the other one uh, that's there. Uh, for those, and my wife usually comes to conferences, she'll be here tomorrow. Uh, we're kind of a partnership of doing crazy things together uh, that's there. Uh, we kind of uh, work together uh, in a lot of cases. She's not in cybersecurity, but she's been around it long enough that she, she does do things and uh, hooks me in the right directions in most of the cases that's there. I've done this all my life. I've done my first uh, pen test was back in 1984, which was a dial-up modem bank for a uh, um, bank uh, located, Valley National Bank located in Phoenix, Arizona at the time that was there. That was my first pen test that I got paid for and that I did. And all I had to do was guess a password to the modem bank that was there. That was a pen test at those points in time uh, that was there. And I've produced that all the way through. I, I've done this pretty much, like I said, most of my life has been in security. I've worked for large companies. I've also founded a bunch of startups along the way. So I've done multiple things that were around me. I've done writing. Um, this is an article how we hacked the White House ages ago uh, in dark reading. I've done stuff on Wi-Fi security. Uh, this is right after the TJX exploits. And we talked about wireless security and how there really was none. And if the, the area that circled down at the bottom basically discusses default passwords and how they're really bad and they're pretty much standard in some of those areas. Not much has changed in those periods of time. Those are still issues we deal with today. 
Um, so this is my, my other side. What did we go wrong? Because we usually come to a point where we have to stop and we have to choose the direction that we need to go uh, in cybersecurity. And this is part of the issue. Some people that have a longer life, more maturity, may select one direction, others select other directions, uh, and we don't really have good areas. But one of the things that I thought was very interesting, this came out of the corporate executive board and from a Gartner organization where they looked at metrics. They looked at the way people generate stuff because that's how organizations, and that's the first thing people will tell you, generate stuff so you can show what you're doing. That's good, but you need to understand that just by just making mounds of paper, PowerPoint, slides, Excel spreadsheets, doesn't mean anybody's reading it. And that's exactly what these surveys actually said, was one, 60% of these metrics are manual process. So it takes your staff or yourself time and effort to produce these. But on the other side of it, it's only used about 25% of the time to make decisions. So the rest of the 75, it's a gut, where it's like we've done this before, or something else. And I think that's part of the things, is you're making all this work to make something that's gonna make better decisions, yet no one actually uses it to make decisions. Hence, part of the problems that are there. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that go. And then as you move up the ladder, most people don't understand it, the third level, they don't see it on a regular basis because there's not a cadence. There's not a monthly meeting, a quarterly meeting, semi-annual, annual meeting where you're presenting findings uh, that are there. And if you're not doing it often enough, it's gonna be a surprise every time. It's there. Almost a quarter of them, it makes no difference. It's not part of their decision-making process. Dollars, cost, people, those fit into some of those decisions. Risks, security, don't often fit. And I think that's one of the things, and again, it's about 10% <clears throat> are used for influence and decisions. So you're coming from a position when you start doing this of like, wow, how am I gonna get better? How am I gonna show I'm getting better? How do I convince people that I need to do the right thing? And that's a portion of the things I think. Why is that hard? And so I took a look at that and said, why is it so difficult? What's wrong with this? I've been doing this a real long time and I've been good at it. What's secrets to success or some of the other things that are around that? It's just not my gray hair or my lack of hair. Um, what is it that's part of that? And I think it's one of the ways this perspective has a lot to do with it. I came in from the world of the dark arts, the black hat, whatever you wish to call it, came in from the outside in into this. Because there wasn't cybersecurity when I was growing up. I, when I went to school for university and everything else, I went to my first computer information management function and we had a speaker coming in and that was the first time I asked the question. I was like, what are you working on? Oh, we're working on this. At the time, it would be equivalent to a CRM tool written in COBOL on running on a mainframe. And I was like, oh, that's good. So what else do you work on? Well, I've been working on that same code for the last nine and a half years. I was like, I, this is not for me. I'm out of here. Because <laughs> for me, that was not where I wanted to be. Because I'm like, I don't want to work on the same thing for nine and a half years. I will. Unfortunately, probably die of boredom or something around that line. I need other things that I want to be able to do. And I think this is the perspective that I said, well, let's take a look. How would you attack? How would you get into your network? That's what cybersecurity is trying to stop bad things from happening. So how do those bad things happen? Just go to the root of the cause, whether it's internal, whether it's external, hackers, criminals, all these elements. How are they doing it and looking at it? So first, you gotta look at yourself. Because it's like, hey, am I getting robbed because I'm using an ATM at 2 a.m. in a bad neighborhood? Oh, yeah, okay, don't do that anymore. That can be a very quick thing. But is it a portion of that? So how is your networks? How do you see? Do you even have visibility into 
to the bad parts? Do you know where things exist anymore? And is it the same way that you thought it was? Because again, I stretch a long period of time. I looked at this five years ago, and this is the way it looked. I look at it today, completely different. Technologies change everything else. Well, that's not the way we designed it. That's not the way it was orchestrated as part of that. And you, get, you just step down through it. Awareness, are your employees aware of things? Do they need to be reminded of things? And then how do you train people? Um, one of the key things that I've leveraged and used in the past are tests, and people are like, point tests. Well, I can either produce a lot of PowerPoints and you go through, or I can just say, hey, we're trying to collect information, can you take this survey for us and figure things out? And you have three answers. One's the correct answer. The other two are thought-provoking questions. And I mean by thought-provoking, not like, well, oh, what's this? Think of like asset, access management and controls of that. And you're trying to tell people about changing passwords and everything else around that. You can say that, oh, do you realize that your passwords need to be changed every 90 days, 60 days, 30 days, whatever your flavor is. Uh, and that is, is the question. But you can also go back, passwords should be simple. And you're like, well, that's the wrong answer. But it causes the user to think. And it causes those areas to go, oh, our passwords long, or should be short. You can even know they actually should be long and they should be that. So this is the correct one. But instead of them going through three PowerPoint slides, one single question got their thought process provoked on that side. So it becomes a training exercise and they don't even know it's a training exercise for what they're trying to do because you're building that relationship with them, but you're also kind of coercing them into a decision that you're trying to get without them going through and saying, oh, I don't want to take training again. Another death by power. We've all been there and it's there. So you really have to know thy enemy, but you have to, in doing so, you need to know yourself. And you need to learn to think how an enemy is going to attack your network. Because if you're still on the, the idea where, hey, I am safe and here, you're living in a world that doesn't exist. It's full of unicorns and ponies, that's great. But the real world is all black and not a pleasant place on the internet that's actually there. So part of this was the idea to say, hey, is this like a mission impossible? Can it even be done? Is this something that is, as Google would call a moonshot, is this something that is just out of the norm that's actually out there? And it's like, no, not really. It's not an impossible mission. It's work. But that's what security is about. It's about work. There's always something to do on the other side of it. That's why I like it. That's why I stay in as long as I have. There's something to do. There's a cause and an effect that's there. Yes, there's lots of running involved. Just like in you know, Mission Impossible movies, you're gonna run. There's a lot of moving parts in your organization. So yes, there's a lot of complexity that you have to unwind, unbox, untangle to understand truly the way things are either built, work, or process that's there. If you don't know your, how your organization builds something from start to finish, or how it produces something, or how the services are delivered, and everything else, it's hard to understand how you're going to make it better when you start trying to put controls and constraints and other things around things. They're like, oh, that'll break that, that'll make your things go. Our, our marketing company won't be able to send email anymore. Okay, you just turned over that Apple card as part of that, but we'll be more secure. You're gonna lose that argument. So you have to figure out how to argue with someone. And I'm like, the same thing, I have kids. And it's like, arguing with kids is much different than arguing with parents <laughs> on that side of it. It's there. You, you, you have the thing, and I'm like, okay, how am I going to use the manipulative word? But how do I, how do I, how do I change your opinion on something? How do I do something around it? And it, it's each of them more different. So you really have to look at that. Um, there's bad news that's part of this because as you get into this area and wanting to make changes, you are you accepted the mission, 
whether you said yes or no, you accepted it. The question is, if it goes wrong, um, like Mission Impossible, you will be disavowed. <laughs> They'll be like, we don't know him. He's gone. He's no longer here. Uh, bad things happen. They're not always. If you if you are guilty of it, the best thing is fess up and say yes. I missed that and get it on that. But at the other side of it, hey, there's not any protocols or anything else that's there. Um, that is an issue, and you're gonna have to live with that. But don't let it paralyze you into making non-decisions. I see a lot of people that are like, oh, I don't wanna rock the apple cart or anything else. You shouldn't be. You should never have that decision that's there. Things are baby steps. It's not a, security's not a binary function that's on or off, like a light switch that I turn on and great, the lights come on and turn it off and it, it, the lights go off. It is a dimmer switch and I can take small incremental steps. It needs to be brighter, it needs to be brighter, it needs to be brighter. It may not as be as fast, it may, may not be as that, but you can at least take those time to be able to do it. Otherwise, you're gonna be like flipping, it's like, oh, factory now. Uh, oops, factory's back on. Well, the productions now has to be reset. And yeah, that's not something that you want to do. But if you've got enough capital, or social capital in your organization that they trust you, which part of security is about trust, that they already do. That's inherent to what you're actually doing. So they trust you, so use that trust. Um, on that side, lean into that. Don't shy away from it. And you, you discover that you're safe when you're out going in a lot of things. The business will ask you to do the impossible. They do it every week of, hey, can this, no, 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 no. Can you put this into the cloud? No. Uh, the, you will be asked to do the impossible and you may be required to do the impossible that's there. And those are things that are you have to kind of adjust accordingly. It's like, uh, this is a really bad idea. That's great, we're still doing it, um, but it's a really bad idea, okay? I can't walk away from it because in doing so, you're getting that sour grape story because it's like, oh, you just don't want to, you just want to work on the easy stuff, the simple stuff. You don't want to do the hard things. And it's like, no, this is the dumb thing that I don't want to do. But we'll be here. We will help. Just when bad things happen, I do get to do that. I told you so dance uh, at your next staff meeting because I did tell you that it was going to happen, and it did. And so, but it, that doesn't give it much satisfaction. I've done it enough times. Uh, but it's part of the same that's there. But I think one of the other things that's off of there is we often overlook of why people can't do something. Is there a hindrance that I don't have resources, people, costs, money, budget, et cetera? But is there some reason that I'm not doing this? I'm busy. Everybody's 120% utilized. I can't add any more to their plates. And those are topics that you need to bring up before. Because if you're not bringing things up ahead of time, especially around resources and constraints that you have for doing things, you will run into problems when you now pop up the, oh, we need more people. Well, everybody needs more people and you're not getting more people because it's late in the program. Things, budgets have already been aligned, things have already been done, cost estimates given, and changing that upstream is now problematic. So you want to be really, really upfront with people uh, that's there. And there's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with sounding like a broken record that says, and, <laughs> hey, always need people, always need money. Every single meeting. Need more people, need more money. And I'm just like, you're sounding like a broken record. Because it's true. Not lying, not telling you nothing. This is what's needed. If you want me to be still this way and still what we're doing, this is where we're going at that level. And I think that's super important. 
Now the question is, how many missions do you go on? How many things are there? Well, it depends. How much is your environment changing? How much is fluid? How much is legacy? How much is organization? And there are certain levels. Every organization is different. Every management structure is different. Every personality is different. There's a lot of difference in there. They all have to come together, work together, to have an outcome that's gonna be a success. So all those differences need to be addressed as you're going through that, and that's oftentimes they're looking out for this. Um, one of the things I always looked at is things like maturity index, and people talk about cybersecurity maturity, and I'm like, what does that mean, I'm old? You think about it, people are always like, hey, it's people, process, and technology. Wow, we have old people running old processes and old hardware. Wow, that doesn't sound good. And I was like, okay, step back. That's not what you wanted. And I think that's one of the issues that comes up. And you see it a lot of times with compliance. People are like, oh, we're compliant. Well, what's the scope of your compliance? Oh, it's this one data center, and in that data center, there's a rack. And in that rack, it's it's compliant to so whatever standards you want to. And you're like, well, <laughs> that's good, but your scope is really narrow, you're really focused. That may be because, hey, that business requires it, but everything else is just you've seen the pictures of things, cables everywhere. And you're like, okay, the one clean rack is the good one, and everything else is that really going to work well? So you start looking at things that's there. People try to think it's like, well. This is big, this is hard. It's not, but people are like, oh, I need a framework. Frameworks work, compliance works. And the issue is that you have to be mature in your process, you have to be mature in your organization for those to actually work from the get-go. If you're not, you're spending a lot of extra time trying to mature your things over a period of time. I cannot go take wine that has just been crushed it in a barrel somewhere and it's been in there 30 minutes and go i want to mature this to five years now it takes five years so the maturity of an organization takes time you can't there are no shortcuts there are no shortcuts it takes time to do that and i think that is one of the key areas that often people overlook is they take a framework and they take a compliance and they go this will just work these processes are not mine. These controls are not mine. How is this going to work? I gotta change everything. It takes time. And I think that's what a lot of people get hung up around. It's like, hey, it's been 24 months. Why hasn't the world changed? And it's like, well, it's been 35 years. Still dealing with freaking password issues. It takes time. That's part of that. Now, as part of that, focus is the key, because there is things coming at you from every vantage point known. And once you get popular, once that you find it, they will make you take it more. It doesn't go down. My inbox is full uh, on things of, hey, can you help? Can you look? Can you do this? What about this? There is more and more and more. That's a good thing. but. You need to keep a focus because you can't do everything. No matter how big your team is, it is not going to be able to deal with the influx of things as things pick up and do as part of that changing a security culture or working to change security culture in an organization that becomes security aware, kind of like AI awareness. All security is important. Guess what? They're going to talk to the security team before they do anything. How do you manage that? And that's the problem. You gotta stay focused on what is important and then what you need to do to, to, to fix the rest of it because they just can't stand. They're asking for help. And if they don't get an answer, they're not gonna respond anymore. But if they get an answer, they'll ask two more questions. So you, it, is a, it is a yin and yang. You really have to look at it's like, what can I focus on? What is low hanging fruit? What is, hey, we don't have time, and it's part of the same thing when you're talking with people and communicating. Just be honest. You know, I can't get to that till October. Is that okay? 
And if their answer is no, we, we go live in September. Well, how long have you known about it? And you can, you can put the evil hat back on. Yeah. Hey, your, your, your poor planning does not justify me changing things on that side. So you can play whatever you want to, but you do have to communicate. Ignoring things will just silence things and all that good effort goes away. And just to imagine too, that good effort you're doing Try not to do things that are too crazy and notification and increase noise in some of those cases of changing something. Oh, we're gonna do well, this is the only way. You'll create more animosity than most of the time. But you do have to manage your time very well. Um, that's there. And I think from the maturity model, it you look at it and people say, well. What really is it? And it's like, hey, we assess the effectiveness of a person or a group that's there. And it helps us derive some capabilities in order to improve performance. It's a quality metric if you want to think about it. Hey, is it good quality, bad quality? What will make it better that's there? But it's very narrow, it's very looking, and it's very focused on some of those areas. And I think a lot of people just say, hey, Here's our maturity model, it's the five steps. We're at two, or we're at four. I can survey an organization and given the title set and where I'm asking the question, if I go to VPs and everything else, they will give between threes and fours. Senior VPs give fours to fives. If I go ask the engineers, they give ones and twos. <laughs> Because they're like, this is just F up. Sorry for dropping the bomb, but it's true. But who I ask determines my maturity of my organization. Whoa, that's not right. So this is where I start getting in some of these areas where that rating side of it is, it's not that maturity. It's yeah. we're taking things and not making sense for them. In other words, the person, the engineers that are measuring the ones and the two, those are the real ratings, but they never get elevated up, just like the information that they provide as it moves through this telephone tag side of the equation, go to the same thing. Of like, oh, this is not important, this is not there, where is it actually at? And I think that's one of the other sides of it. Now, people have looked at maturity cycles and say, you can do a top-down approach, which is your classic stair step, one through five, you can do what is a bottom-up approach where they'll say, hey, these are clusters. So if you have two levels of maturity, we'll cluster all those together because maybe it's a system that we can fix and we can increase it. And so they have the clustering idea to say, hey, put all these objects or all these things that you're asking about for maturity scale into a cluster and see if it correlates together instead of having 500 things, you're now having 50 things to be able to deal with and some of that. But again, it's people, technology, processes that are there, that you're measuring on those sides of it that's there. Uh, and if we were really measuring technology, you would not have legacy in your environment. So we're not really measuring. Or maybe we're measuring wrong. Because the mainframe, you know what? If you look at the maturity level, hey, it's got a five. It's almost as mature as like Windows XP has been around for 35 years. You can sit there and go, well, yeah, age has something to do with it, but it doesn't make anything different. It's about the controls and some of the other aspects that are there. Always think about the actions of people out of the world. If it's bad and they can do nothing about it, that's a problem. It's two problems on two fronts. One, you can't do something about a risk, and that's bad thing, but secondly, you don't have a choice. So on the other side of it, if I can do something, why is it not done? And I think it's one of the key things you see it time and time again. Somebody will be like, oh, you didn't do your session cookie right when you built the application. And then the developer's like, yes, I did. And you're like, oh, tell me. And then prove to me. And you're like, oh, here, here's Burp, and look, I just got free two laptops and a power supply shipped to my house for free, is that okay? Uh, and they're like, oh yeah, we'll fix that. But you have to take that effort to prove to them, okay? 
because they looked at it and said, oh, I don't do anything wrong. But that action is the action that you wanted to occur on the outside. So action's always gonna speak louder than words. Corrective action, so speak, hey, we fix something. And you should always take credit for things that you fix. Because most of the time we fix something and we're off to something else. And no one knows about it, except for that small little group that was there that you helped. The problem is that, hey, they don't tell people and they don't communicate. And if you're trying to grow that culture-wise and everything else and maturity-wise, you need to communicate that and communicate it up well that, hey, I fixed this. And here in, you don't have to tell them how. You can just fix it. And that's all they care about. Okay, that's something that's checked on the checkbox. Because eventually what ends up happening is you end up going like, oh, we have all these findings that no one's taken care of. Oh, well, we did. Okay, we didn't report on that, but no one's tracking it, no one's seeing it um, that's there. Now, hey, let's not, if internal audit gives you a finding, well, you gotta do something immediately on that one. I'm like, why not cybersecurity? And you're like, oh yeah, that's important too. But you, your actions always speak louder than words. And who you ask will always be those results, but also who you tell is just as important of questions that are asked that are part of that. One of the most common things is like, hey, I need to identify my risk. What, what's, what keeps me up at night? And whether it's at the executive level, board level, everything else, who are you communicating with and everything else? Well, and I tell people the first thing is, you need to know what you have. And people are like, I do. And then I ask, how many laptops do you have? And the first answer is like, around 5,000. And I'm like, that's not the answer you need. Unless your answer was, well, it was 498 yesterday, and I'm pretty sure we had two new employees get new ones that's there. That's a different answer, but should be exact numbers. How many cloud instances do you have? How many of other things? You have to do what you have if I'm actually trying to secure anything. That's there, and you really have to hammer on that because I can tell you the world of like, hey, I don't know, but I can go look it up in my CMDB. I'm, lightning's not going to strike me at this point in time, but it, we all know that it's like, oh, that's out, that was outdated like three years ago, and uh, not accurate whatsoever. So where's the source of truth? Who has the source of truth? Does anybody have the source of truth? And no one's going to come up and say, yeah, this is 100% accurate. Doesn't need to be, but it needs to be somewhere close so that's there. Because, hey, is this our, our internal IP address, external, our cloud instances, what's going on? How is this there? And that's a portion of it. So once you kind of build that first, you can go to the next thing. Take that, all that information and slice it into as many ways as you can think of using it. Slice it into geographic location. So, hey, if I want to know all the systems in China, I can get a feed. <laughs> hey, if I want to know what type of admin systems are out there, here it is. If I want to type of my Windows 2003 that are end of life, here it is. Slice and dice the data in all these different ways and keep it so that it's always, because you'll use it. It'll help you make decisions. But if that is not there, how are you making your decision? How do I know if I need to push this patch for Adobe Reader when I don't even know how many people have Adobe Reader? I don't know what it's going to impact. Maybe it's five. Maybe it's 50,000. There's an issue. And I need to understand that. And until I actually know what I have, making decisions and flying by the seat of your pants or using your gut, you're not making good informed decisions. That's there. And then once you're done with that, rank the assets. And what I mean by rank, is it important or not? Because there are some of our assets that are not important as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they may be important to other departments, as far as the things, and people are like, well, how do you verify importance? Because if I ask every different group, every group's gonna tell me, yes, Mine's important. Critical to the business that's there. 
the business won't run anymore if this goes down. You're like, okay. So how do I verify that? Because everybody's gonna tell me everything's important and then I just have a list of everything's important and that sucks. So how do I verify that? Use your own information. Go into your ticketing system, help desk, see if those systems are marked as a P1 critical vulnerability. So if something happens, it immediately escalates to P1. Guess what, those are your critical systems. Already been done, already verified, already there. If it's not in there, maybe you should elevate it. Or maybe not. Maybe the, it's more important to that department, not to the rest of the company. But help desk tickets are a great way to see what is critical and what is not critical. Because if it's built around that and it's an IT-owned system, yes. Business-owned system, they not even have help desk. But they'll scream if it's down. Uh, so look for those kind of things that are there. Don't you don't have to create new data? You don't have to create an index. You don't have to try to do something. But do. you can look and say, okay, I have no idea. Well, does it contain any of the kind of data that you were scared that somebody else has? PII data, privacy data, customer data, employee data. What's on it? Where's it at? What can happen? With that. And I think those are the critical things you can ask yourself and make a assumed decision, but you also have the data that empirically that's out there already. And I think that's one of the key areas um, that's part of that. Risk is not simple. Everybody's seen this heat map. Don't ever use the heat map. <laughs> uh, it's not a good visualization. It works great for people like, oh, this is great, but it's part of the thing. Risk is not simple. Risk models are mathematical representations of systems on that side of it that's there. The problem is that you, we do simple math. We have skimmed it down to, as you can see, the impact and likelihood. Hey, here it is. Here's our little metrics. And look, we have different levels and everything else that's there. So. Here's the impact and here's the likelihood. So how many people have heard that it's like, it's not if, but when you get breached? And you've told that to CEOs multiple times, or boards multiple times, or other managers multiple times. So you just took the likelihood and skewed it. It's done. Likelihood is very likely. Scroll. Okay, my, my matrix now is just a bar chart that's all based upon impact. Well, that makes no risk decisions based on impact. It can. Hey, this is critical, but where is it actually at? But what if I have controls around it? Zero day du jour, whatever this week is for Microsoft or uh, F5 or Pulse Secure, Fortinet, whatever it is. There's one out there that's been released, multiple that's there, are there any mitigations that are being used? Because that changes that portion of that. What's the value of the asset? Hey, if we burn this cloud infrastructure down, we lose all our data, that is a lot of stuff that will not be done. That is $100 million gone that's there. So there's a value that's associated with the stuff that often is not looked at, that's there. And so there's pluses and minuses behind it that we've forgotten about. But they're part of your toolkit. It's kind of like, you know, I'm still using the hammer and the screwdriver and that's my only tools. And it's like, yeah, but you have sockets and pliers and all these other things, but I like the hammer and I like the screwdriver. It's like, that's good, you're comfortable with it. Step away from those new tools because it's the key now one of the things about risk that's there and I'll, I'll show some slides that developed is like visual is the key because I'm taking risk which is a really complicated understanding for mathematical functions that are there and I'm trying to talk to business leaders about it so we try to simplify it as much as possible but I think we try to simplify it too much. We should have tried to visualize it as much as possible. Because visualization sometimes makes it simpler.
for them to understand what is actually occurring. This there versus, hey, this is 2.6, and we move from 2.6 to 2.3. Well, that's good, right? The lower is better or is up more better? Which one is it? You, we miss kind of the boats that are there. And we do a lot of extra work to not get the outcome that we want or be able to display in some of those. So one of the areas, here's some areas that we'll go through. It's like pick four major categories. And this could be for any manufacturing organization. It's like, hey, brand damage, really, really bad. Here are things that we, we want to look at. These may be in your risk register. These may be questions that the board has asked you. These may be questions that the CEO has asked you, your CFO, any of the people along those lines of, hey, what about third party suppliers? What about if they steal privacy data, intellectual property, software, supply chain? All those things fall in there. And the ones that are red, those are important, but I don't have the budget or staff to do this. So I'm telling you ahead of time, those are important and they're red. Not going to worry about them. It's a good discussion content, kind of like an icebreaker, but they now understand that. Now, everybody's data is more important than their employees. I can tell you that's the same for every organization, but no one will put it in writing. But that's one of the key things that's part of that. Same with supply chain disruption, sales disruption, business processes disruption. And then we use the same matrix, risk and likelihood. And we plot the little colors on the chart and says, now you know where things sit. My risk ratings and everything else are there. They sit. Hey, here's my high residential risk. Here's my low risk. You want to be in the lower quadrant. It's a darker quadrant or something. I'm ignoring you. Okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah. I'm waiting to see what you're doing for my laptop. Turn up on my port. Ah, so you have it on to the left side of it and says, hey, here's where bubbles are. Here's where my risks are associated with those scenarios that are there. The second chart is, here's how my road from my 2020 risk to my 2021 risk, here's what's actually occurred. Some risk got more, some risk got lower because I had a program, I did something about it. We changed the way we do business. Things changed on that, so I lowered some of my risk. Other things naturally got worse. And they do. It's no fault of your own. You didn't do anything. You did not do something, but you didn't do anything, and it just got worse. And it, internet is like that. Things will go. Hey, we we still decided that we think Exchange is like the greatest email system in the world, so we decided we're still sticking with on-prem Exchange. I think that would have been changed this year. But those are things that you run into that get sucked back in. But in a visualization side of it, everybody in the room gets the chart on the right. Immediately. It's there. You can use a, a, a circle or a line that says, here is our risk acceptance threshold. That's there. We are trying to bring everything that's on the outside of that to the inside. Maybe that's your full things that you're targeted is everything that's on the outside because it's not acceptable. We want to bring it in. That's there. Maybe you're driven by your supply chain. Maybe you're driven by business. Maybe you're driven by your third parties and partnerships. Maybe you're driven by VC funds. Guess what? All those things pull into that equation. But the visualization of it is what you're trying to get your point across. It doesn't matter what kind of math you use, where it's at, but the visualization to tell people, here's what, when we've done, here's how we did it, that's there and it's aligned to a project, a person, more priority, a technology, you can find that and do a story with each one of these. And communicate that story. That's there. And it doesn't have to be a risk conversation. And I think that is the key, that our visualization of risk is still an Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Doesn't mean that you don't use an Excel spreadsheet to create it. 
But that's not what I'm going to present to people that are outside my area of focus. Because now I have to explain everything to them. What is this TS, the TLS and Cypher Suite stuff that you're replacing on all the web servers that are there? And then you're getting to like, oh no, it's kind of like when you take a straw and you put it into a soda and sip, that's the tunnel that's built. And you're like, you've done run down a rat hole. You're done. You don't want to do that. That's why I'm saying this, they get simple, straightforward. Here's what's changed, here's what's got worse. Let's talk about it. Because that's the conversation you want to have. What are you going to do about it? What do you think I should do about it? Because that would be the next conversation. What are you doing about the ones that are moving into the grid? Not, what about this gray one that's over in the left-hand corner? Always the HR department. So, one of the key things that I always look at, and this has been done from that, is where's it being driven from in decisions and the process on that? And if you look at it from the staging of it, Every level you're away from your CEO, that's another gating interference communication effort. Even if you have direct communication that you can send to the CEO and everything else, it's about how the information is gathered up and not gathered up. And this is different in every organization. But a lot of times, hey, if you if the I report to the CIO and the CIO reports to the CFO and the CFO reports to the CEO. So all my information that I give to the CIO, he gives half of that to the CFO, and the CFO takes that and cuts it in half again to the other one. And when I first started doing board of director things, I remember you had four slides, you got through three, and then you were allocated like a half an hour, and they cut you to like 15 minutes and 10 minutes that were there. Now you have a special event, you're on for an hour, and you have another whole day uh, kind of scenarios in your life. Yeah, thank you for coming, wishes and dreams coming true. Here's the outcomes of that, more work. But, hey, you're, you're able to get this, and it is now moved up. Media has helped. It's like everybody's concerned about it, everybody wants to ask questions about it, but everybody wants to ask questions, and then that's one of the key areas that you have to be careful of. So, I don't want to say that CEOs don't care about cybersecurity, but it's not on their top 10. It may be, maybe in their top 10 of like, I'm concerned about it, but they think someone else is handling it. It's kind of like, hey, I'm concerned I won't be able to get employees. HR is handling that problem. I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to sell more products. Sales is taking care of that. It is dissemination of that. And you need to be ready for that. Because a lot of people, five years ago, 10 years ago, people were complaining that they, didn't, they weren't sitting at the table. Well, when you sit at the table, it comes with the responsibility of sitting at the table. What are you bringing to the table? That's the question they're gonna ask. And they're gonna expect you to be able to answer. And like, hey, or we wanna do this, is this okay? And you look at it, well, I think I'll let the business decide. And they're gonna look at you and like, you're here to decide. You are the business as part of this, so you need to make a decision. And you need to be ready for that, because a lot of times that doesn't. You are the point person. You own it, they expect you to own it, they expect you to deliver for it, and they expect you to, to be accountable for it. Trying to shake it, push it, move it, you're gonna get into bad situations across the board that's there. You typically have to manage, you have to manage expectations, you have to manage deliverables, you have to manage different things along the way, and how you communicate that is also important that's there. Um, you will own things that people hate. Shadow IT is a perfect example of it. I, I take over shadow IT things. Why? Because they're unloved, uncared for, sitting on someone's desk and it's like, this is really bad. Let me take over the responsibility for doing this. And they're like, thank you, here. But I'm thankful because now it gets patched, it gets updates, it gets fixed, versus before it's staying there and it's not gonna change. It's 
been there for four years, it's gonna stay there for another four years until the Russians break in and hide on it uh, in the lab environment to shift on that. And that's there. At some point, you might even own patching. I own patching for workstations. Simply due to the fact that Dell was like, I'm tired of not patching stuff. And they're like, don't touch the servers. And I was like, fine, we'll take over the workstations because they have a larger footprint. And we did this long before COVID and everything else. And it's really nice that we did because, hey, if we had to rely on you guys, it would take forever to meet their SLA, which you would not meet. But now, hey, we're all the workstations, all the attack surfaces are being greatly reduced in some of those cases. You will own things that are that there. Be prepared for that because you're you will get asked on those sides and you will butt heads at those times. And sometimes it's just like, well, fine, you take it over. And you're like, but I don't want to take it over. But you complain about it and you complain last three meetings, so it's now your responsibility. But I don't well, you still do, and great, you have eight more people that are added to your team as part of that. That's great, but you will own what you don't complain about in a lot of times. So just be prepared on that. And it's a mature process to go, I own it, great, I'll make it better. Thank you. Don't, oh, I can't do this. Because immediately you down in the depth. Well, you don't, you want to complain about it, but you don't want to take action on it. We all know those people. They all drive us crazy, crazy in meetings on multiple times a day. But yeah, I'll complain and complain and complain, but I'll never do anything about the plan. I just want to complain. That's great. Time waste on that. So when they give you something, take ownership, make it better. It's there. Um, be prepared. And I think this is just a maturity cycle that's there. The second you turn over a rock, you find bugs. The second you look at a server a little closer, you find bugs. And the second you do a vulnerability scan for ports, and then you go onto the device and scan it, you find a lot more stuff. You're going to find more things. Just be prepared that it's like, hey, this is the tip of the iceberg, and we're draining everything down. And it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger on that will work to get it done. You have security debt, you have technical debt, you have IT debt, you have legacy debt. You have all these debt things that no one wants to pay the bill for that you're going to have to do something with. So figure out where it's there. Figure out your own ratings. What's important? What's not important? What's your short list? What's your long list? It's there. I always carry the list of, as a topic on that. I carry a list that if the business said, hey, you need to cut everything by 25%, what would you do? There you go. Everybody in supply chain organizations has those lists. You should too. Also, if they say, here's another check, how much do you need? Well, here's my current list wish. Wish list, not this wish. On there, already done. Here, give it to CFO. Can you write me a check today? Bitcoin, actually. Um, no, I think that's one of the key things. But you, you need to figure out how you're stacking stuff, how priorities are generated. Because you can do it by dollars, you can do it by 10, but standardize on something. And keep it for more than a year. Because if you go, hey, this is working good, we're, we're the consumer reports, little dials and everything else, 25% uh, done, half done, 75% done, complete. Uh, that's fine, just make sure you keep it and that's what's being shown. If you change too much, people now don't understand. Make it visual so they can simply understand that the colors are great, this is why you have black jet charts. Hey, red, I know that's bad. Green's good, red's bad, yellow's okay. So, hey, people will understand that. That's why they're kind of sucked into that. Doesn't mean to use it, because once somebody figures it out, it's easy, but you need to standardize on it and keep it, because otherwise it's there. You also need to do some things of, hey, here's my stack of stuff that we want to do. What's the minimum? What's the maximum? What's the average? Is it all horrible and high risk? Is it somewhat there, maybe a little bit less, 
where does it sit and what's the plan that's there? Um, note to self, any global organizations do not use A through F. That is a very, very US-centric rating system. <laughs> Didn't figure that out until I used it and then I had half my people overseas going, what does an A mean? Is that good? And I was like, I was like, uh, that's like what we get in school. Oh, we get ones and I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Something that you thought was simple doesn't always get in. So another thing, share things openly before the final product goes out. Uh, in a lot of cases, yeah, yeah, they'll save yourself from making assumptions on that. That's there. You need to figure out your own schedule, or it will be dictated to you. And if you're like, hey, we're completely fully utilized until November, that's there. Uh, but you need to show that you're fully utilized. Don't make it up. And like, I don't want to work on November. Uh, that's there because you will be called to that. And you will be told that, no, this needs to be done. You need to reprioritize. So always be able to pick something up and move it. It's there. If you can't pick it up and move it, do do other things. You, everybody needs to know that. Oh, we have consultants on site. We have this. This is going to be two weeks. We can't do it here. Don't commit to it and not do it because that just gets you in hot water. Somebody's watching you and will determine that. And I think that's one of the key things. You really have to be there. If it's really broken, is it worth fixing? That's an assumption. Do I it's not stupid. I mean, it's done. It's legacy. It's not. And you'll find those things. Oh, this just takes this invoice and emails it to this company. Uh, don't we have a whole system that does this in finance? Yes. Well, why can't we use this now? Well, this is the way, this was our first vendor that we set up, and this is just the way it works. And you're like, well, get rid of it. Stop it. It's there. So be aware that things that are bad, broken, and legacy, always ask the question, should I fix it or should I kill it? Get rid of it. Because sometimes people try to fix things that should be killed. Unfortunately, hey, this just doesn't work. It's never worked really well. Just move on from that. That's there. Um, it's all fun until someone gets hurt. And the reason I say that is most businesses that define what they call critical risk and their policies and controls standards that are there, that are there. And they're typically around like three areas, unfortunately. It's not my thing. One, yeah, two people have to die. Not just one person, two people have to die from some defect or something that's actually there. Uh, that's part of that. There's always dollars that are lost in sales. There's always dollars that are lost in revenue. And that's usually it. Uh, there's no cybersecurity. There's no ransomware. There's no anything else. It's human life and money. So again, that's usually private business. There may be others in organizations, different verticals, different things that are there, but it's always there. The term material risk is also important. Use it incorrectly, the lawyer in the room will laugh at you and maybe correct you or may not say anything on that. Material risk is typically some percentage of your total revenue targets that are actually there. So the more money you make, the larger your revenue is. Therefore, the larger the risk acceptance they are willing to take or what is material that would impact the revenue stream now becomes critical. And that can be huge. That's there. And if that's huge, you, you have an issue. Because if I define my risk as like, hey, this could cost a million dollars, and that is not a material loss for an organization, guess what? If a million dollars is not enough for you, what is 50,000? What is 100,000? So you really have to be careful on that side of it. What is the material risk for your organization you need to accept? Is it 3% of your revenue, 5, 10? 
Is there are you a public trading company? No. All those are questions that are there, and then you get into third party and fourth party risk that are associated with your side of it. You're also into doing assessment, questionnaires, is it human interaction, or just electronic. How are things being structured and moved along in a lot of cases that are there? And then who are the players? What are the audits? Where do they go? Um, that's there. Is there a winner? Talking about risk, there is not a winner. It's kind of like the casino. House wins 50% of the time, or a little more than 50% of the time. So you take your winnings and walk away before they steal them back. If you're trying to understand risk, you have to understand your audience. Who's talking to, where are they at, that. Visualization is key. You also need to get buy-in and the issues. Have those conversations where I reach out to someone, communicate with them, and get them to agree with me. This is bad. Like I said, it's hard. talking with children in some cases. Yes, you agree that this is bad, and we don't want to do this. We don't want to lose intellectual property to the nearest competitor. No, we don't. Okay, now that you agree and got consensus on it, you can move and step forward. It's like a conversation going up the stairs. And I think that's super incredible, and you need to do that on that. Uh, you can use your competitors with what they find. We're a community. Most, most of your competitor CSOs will talk to you. And they're actually a lot of good friends on that side of it, and they can have conversations and you can talk to them that's there. Same thing goes for standards, best practices, whose best practices that are a part of that. And that, what is important to you? What's not? It's not trade secrets, it's sharing of that. And we all get better when we share this kind of information uh, that's part of that. When you do risk, there's things you can do with it. You can try to defend it, you can try to transfer it, you can mitigate it, or you can accept it, or you can get rid of it, erase it. Each of those has a good thing and a bad thing. And it's one of those things. It's, it's there. There's not a good and a bad. Each situation is going to be different. I wish I could tell you 10% of these are going to be defend, 40% are going to be transfer, the rest are mitigation, or 1% is going to be acceptance. 50% is probably closer to the real acceptance level. Just be aware. Different organizations have that risk appetite that's there. That's there. I want to thank everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody and everything else that's there. Again, follow me, find me. You can send me an email. Uh, don't put me on spam list because I will return the favor. Uh, I'm ninja at lenovo.com or rrushing at Motorola. Either one is do it. Uh, Please take a time to introduce some, yourself to someone uh, in here. I am really about community and making the world a better place. And the only way to do that is if we work together. And I'm really strong about that. Security is about doing. It's not about talking about it. It's about doing it. And we all have to do it that's there. And if you want to get stuff out of life and get what you wish for, it's a, hard, a lot of work. So if you want to be the person that reports to the CEO and everything else, it's not an easy thing. Is it rewarding? Oh, hell yes. Is it a lot of work? Yes. But every day you make a difference and you make a change and you can see it. So I strongly recommend it and everything else. And I really appreciate the time on that. I'll be around uh, all day today and tomorrow, so if you have any questions, I know we have another speaker coming up, uh, and I appreciate it from everybody. So thank you again. I appreciate it.